Okay. The Committee on Homeland Security, Subcommittee on Transportation and Protective Security will come to order. Uh, let me apologize for my delay today. This is, my, I think, my third or fourth meeting already today, so I'm already behind, and I apologize for that. Uh, the subcommittee is meeting today to assess the Transportation Security Administration's preparedness for the approaching peak summer travel period. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. The summer months have historically seen an increase in aviation travel this year, and this year is no exception. Following a record-breaking 2018 spring travel season, the warmer temperatures of summer are expected to draw even bigger passenger volumes. In fact, TSA is preparing for its busiest travel season ever and expects to screen more than 243 million passengers and crew from Memorial Day through Labor Day. That's a stunning number. We've seen this situation before in 2016 when unprecedented passenger volumes overwhelmed checkpoints across the nation. Many people miss flights due to wait times in excess of 75 minutes, although some reports contended that wait times were closer to three hours. Passengers shared photos and anecdotes online of seemingly interminable airport security lines and the hashtag, I hate the wait, united disgruntled passengers across the country. History has a way of repeating itself, and TSA currently faces pressure from Congress, the public, and aviation stakeholders to avoid past mistakes. Therefore, the purpose of this hearing is to evaluate TSA's preparedness to accommodate the demands of this year's peak summer travel. TSA's preparedness ultimately ensures the security of the traveling public, but efficient checkpoint operations also bolster the free movement of people and goods, which brings in billions of dollars to the U.S. economy each year. Conversely, as evidenced by the 2016 wait time crisis, the checkpoint can also be the choke point that prevents the aviation sector from functioning seamlessly. This in itself can prove to be an adverse security scenario in a time when threats to crowded spaces of public areas are an increasing concern. In short, all roads lead back to the checkpoint, which is why this hearing today is so important and so timely. While a variety of factors may have negatively impacted operations at individual airports, we can point to three major errors that helped to generate a perfect storm in 2016. First, TSA's staffing allocation model did not accurately represent the unique needs or true operation conditions of individual airports. Compounded with a pervasive transportation security officer staffing shortage and high, uh, high attrition rate, miscalculations prevented TSA from responding promptly to, increase in, to increases in passenger wait times. Second, Deficient communication between TSA and stakeholders resulted in missed opportunities to share flight schedules, staffing plans, and facility changes in real time. Third, TSA significantly overestimated the amount of passengers who would receive expedited screening by way of trusted traveler programs like PreCheck or Global Entry. Specifically, TSA assumed that 50% of passengers would use expedited screening but only about 27% of passengers used expedited screening in 2016, and we've got to work on that. Last Congress, the House and Senate passed my bill, the Checkpoint Optimization and Efficiency Act, to address the gridlock at airport checkpoints throughout the United States and boost enrollment in TSA PreCheck. I look forward to discussing how this legislation has impacted enrollment figures and how TSA plans to continue their expansion efforts. We're nowhere near where we need to be, and we've got to get better at it. While TSA has come a long way since the wait times crisis in 2016, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the similarities between the conditions today and the conditions two years ago. Passenger volume continues to grow by about 4% a year, and TSA's staffing has not kept pace. Despite TSA's concerted efforts to recruit and retain quality TSOs, the TSO attrition rate continues to be troubling and has a direct impact on the availability of screening lanes at airports. In turn, the limited availability of screening lanes translate to longer checkpoint wait times and an increased reliance on expedited screening measures to facilitate throughput. Lately, despite vocal disapproval from this subcommittee, TSA has been granting pre-check status to passengers who have not enrolled in the program in an effort to reduce congestion at checkpoints. I myself have personally witnessed this on many occasions. I've repeatedly expressed to TSA that pre-check should not be used to manage traffic, especially under the guise of risk-based security. In the near future, I will be introducing legislation to ensure that pre-check lanes are available only to pre-check passengers in pre-check or another trusted traveler program. Pre-check, when used as designed, is a valuable tool that enables TSA to assess a passenger's risk to aviation security 
prior to the arrival at an airport checkpoint. By providing expedited screening to pre-vetted populations, TSA can direct additional TSOs to standard lanes to screen unknown travelers. Pre-check and other trusted traveler programs, when used as designed, not as currently implemented, are undoubtedly some of the best tools in TSA's toolbox. However, TSA's efforts to increase enrollment, participation in a pre-check program has stagnated after reaching nearly six million travelers. Undoubtedly, many passengers are frustrated by TSA's frivolous practice of merging non-enrolled travelers into pre-check screening lanes and disappointed in the limited availability of pre-check lanes at many airports. The efficient operation of airport checkpoints, combined with effective management of the pre-check program, go hand in hand when it comes to the overall security mission of TSA. That is why I am pleased to have two distinguished panels here today from both the public and private sectors, representing a diversity of perspectives on this issue. And I look forward to hearing from them on how we can move all forward uh, in a collaborative spirit to provide better, more efficient security to the American people. I would like to thank Mr. Darby LaJoy and Mr. Bill Russell, who, uh, as well as our second panel for appearing before the subcommittee today to discuss this important topic. I am pleased to recognize a ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentle lady from New Jersey, Ms. Watson Coleman, for her opening statement. Good morning and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing, and I want to thank the witnesses uh, for both panels for agreeing to uh, be here today. And it's good to have TSA here because your work is so important, and we always have so many questions, and things are always sort of very dynamic and, and moving along. TSA has, however, had a long struggle with how to most efficiently and effectively manage its resources. In 2011, TSA introduced the pre-check program for low-risk passengers who provide fingerprints and undergo background checks to receive expedited screening, security screening. Used in combination with intelligence and watch list matching programs, PreCheck allows TSA to focus its limited screening resources more effectively. The PreCheck program has, however, had some setbacks. Unfortunately, by 2013, TSA's efforts to drive more passenger traffic into pre-check lanes caused it to adopt a practice known as the managed inclusion, which relied heavily upon behavior detection officers and iPod randomizing, randomizing apps to expedite screening for large members of numbers of passengers who had not enrolled in pre-check. Last Congress, Ranking Member Thompson introduced a bill to curtail the use of managed inclusion. And after the bill passed the House, then Administrator Neffinger directed that the practice be phased out. Although managed inclusion came to an end in September 2015, TSA continues to use passenger screening canines and other tools to pre-screen pre passengers who have not enrolled in pre-check and provide them access Access to expedited screening. TSA has said it intends to modify these practices. Given the evolving threat landscape, it must do so expeditiously. Every passenger must receive an appropriate level of screening. TSA must also address the underlying factors that have led to these practices. TSA has cited a lack of enrollment in pre-check and other DHS trusted traveler programs as one reason for their development. However, these practices may provide a disincentive for those who would otherwise consider enrolling in pre-check, thus inhibiting the growth of the program. TSA has struggled to partner with industry effectively to encourage creative enrollment solutions. As the agency withdrew a request for proposals in 2016 citing cybersecurity concerns. I encourage TSA to work through these concerns and issue a new solicitation. In addition, TSA has cited growing passenger volume and a lack of sufficient staffing as major challenges. In the summer of 2016, we saw unacceptably long wait lines, wait times at TSA checkpoints, as staffing levels were insufficient to process the number of travelers. TSA has increased its staff since that time, but it has not kept pace with increases in passenger volumes and the president's fiscal year 2019 budget proposal does not request enough staff to close the gap. I hope future TSA budget proposals will be more realistic when it comes to staffing levels. 
By increasing trusted traveler program enrollments and staffing levels, TSA could take another step forward in developing a risk-based security model. <coughs> Excuse me. I also want to mention an article from this morning's New York Times, which I'd like to enter into the record, Mr. Chairman. Without <coughs> objection, so ordered. Thank you. This article discusses a secret watch list that TSA maintains to monitor people who may be potential threats at airport checkpoints on the grounds that they may appear suspicious or rowdy. I look forward to hearing more from TSA about this watch list as I am concerned about the civil liberty implications of such a list. Finally, at a hearing where we were, are discussing passenger volumes with travel industry experts, I would be remiss if I did not note some disturbing trends in recent travel data. While domestic travel continues to increase, the same cannot be said of international travel to the United States. According to the Department of Commerce, in just the first three months of the Trump's presidency, nearly 700,000 fewer foreign travelers visited the U.S. than normal, representing a 4.2% decrease and a loss of $2.7 billion in spending. Over the first nine months of 2017, U.S. arrivals dropped by 1.4%, despite international travel increasing worldwide by 4.6%. It is plain and obvious that the president's rhetoric and policies are having a depressing effect on the desire of foreign travelers to visit our beautiful country. His racially and religiously motivated travel bans, his obsession with building a wall and separating children from their mothers at the border, and his disparaging remarks towards the people of Mexico, Haiti, El Salvador, and the entire continent of Africa hurt our country's reputation and send the message that outsiders are not welcome here. Just yesterday, he called immigrants animals, disrespectful, dangerous language that should never be spoken by a president. Tourism represents the seventh largest employer in the United States as international travel supports 1.2 million American jobs, accounting for $32.4 billion in wages. I look forward to discussing with our travel industry witnesses that are here today how the president has put their industry at risk. Again, I thank my chairman and our witnesses for coming, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Watson-Coleman. Other members of the subcommittee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. We are pleased to have two distinguished panels of witnesses before us today. Let me remind the witnesses that your entire written statement will, be, will appear in the record. On our first panel, we are pleased to have Mr. Darby LaJoy, the Assistant Administrator for TSA's Office of Security Operations, here to testify before us today on this critical topic. In his role as Assistant Administrator, Mr. LaJoy oversees airport checkpoints and baggage screening operations, regulatory compliance, cargo inspections, and other specialized programs designed to secure transportation. Previously, Mr. LaJoy served as a Federal Security Director of Los Angeles and was responsible for Los Angeles International Airport, Ontario International Airport, and Palm Springs International Airport, with intermodal responsibilities throughout Southern California and Hawaii. He also served as a federal security director at John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York. And before joining TSA, Mr. LaJoy served in the U.S. Army in various light infantry and airborne units, just like my son, who's going to, going to Ranger School in about a month. Uh, sir, thank you for your service to this country and for continuing your service in your current role. You are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Good afternoon, Chairman Katko, Ranking Member Watson Coleman, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today along with Mr. Bill Russell of the Government Accountability Office to discuss the Transportation Security Administration's approach to the upcoming summer travel season and TSA PreCheck. As the Executive Assistant Administrator for Security Operations, I'm responsible for overseeing the TSA's frontline employees who are charged with ensuring the free movement of people and commerce while safeguarding the traveling public from a determined and dynamic adversary. Last year's terrorist plot in Australia reminds us of what we have known for some time. The threat to aviation is as real as ever. 
Current intelligence indicates that commercial aviation remains a top priority target, and our adversaries continue to educate their followers on building and concealing explosives to evade checkpoint security measures. Meanwhile, a pattern of less sophisticated techniques and tactics has also emerged. In short, attacks today may be sophisticated and well-planned with a goal of causing massive global economic impacts or impromptu acts with little preparation other than the desire to inflict damage and create fear. The atrocities at Brussels International Airport and Istanbul Ataturk Airport in 2016, as well as attacks in Nice, Paris, Stockholm, Hamburg, Barcelona, London, and Manhattan highlight the evolving tactics and techniques employed by terrorists to target civilians in public areas. The global intelligence and security community, including the aviation security community, must continually reassess our detection and disruption tactics. At the same time, the world's reliance on the aviation network to facilitate the movement of people and goods continues to grow. On an average day in 2017, TSA officers came into contact with nearly 2.1 million travelers at one of more than 440 federalized airports nationwide, and travel volumes continue to increase. While TSA continues to achieve its objectives, meeting growing demands comes at the cost of training and personal leave requirements for our officers. Those trade-offs ultimately impact morale, turnover, and performance. The additional 717 officers included in the FY19 budget request will help address the current shortfall. TSA is now preparing for what is projected to be one of the agency's busiest summer seasons on record. To ensure there are sufficient officers available to meet the summer demand, TSA has conducted hiring events at hard to hire and high volume airports, increased advertising and media outreach to recruit new hires, and improved the hiring and new employee training processes. These efforts will ensure TSA is positioned to effectively meet projected screening demands this summer while mitigating passenger wait times at our checkpoints. In addition to ensuring availability of staff to meet increased passenger volumes, both canines and enhanced technology will play an integral role in TSA's checkpoint strategy. This summer, TSA expects an additional 50 operational passenger screening canine teams as compared to July of 2017. Along with expanded canine use, TSA is committed to enhancing checkpoint screening through the strategic deployment of new and effective technology. Presently, TSA is in the process of testing computed tomography screening systems for use at domestic airport checkpoints. We expect to have approximately 35 systems deployed at our labs, in our training centers, or at our airports over the course of the summer. Another effective tool to assist with checkpoint efficiency is a comprehensive Trusted Traveler program. Currently, there are more than 13 million travelers in DHS Trusted Travel programs, including 6.4 million enrolled in TSA PreCheck. Since 2014, we have seen the trusted travel population increase by 500%. TSA is also focusing on expanding vetting capabilities and implementing innovative technology procedures that will allow us to move to a fundamentally more dynamic system of segmenting passengers according to risk and applying the appropriate level of screening. In closing, TSA remains dedicated to securing the nation's transportation systems from terrorist attacks. We will continue to improve transportation security through a committed workforce and the development and implementation of intelligence-driven, risk-based policies and plans. I appreciate the subcommittee's continued support of the TSA mission and thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I look forward to, look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. LaJoy, and I appreciate you staying under the time limit. That's not always the way, so thank you very much. No pressure on you, Mr. Russell. <laughs> Our second witness is Mr. Bill Russell, the Acting Director of the U.S. Government Accountability Office's Homeland Security and Justice Team. In his current role, Mr. Russell is responsible for leading a portfolio of work on transportation security issues. This includes assessing progress the federal government has made in effectively allocating and balancing security resources across transportation modes while facilitating the legitimate flow of commerce and people. Since joining GAO in 2002, Mr. Russell has been the recipient of several GAO-wide awards, including two Meritorious Service Awards and two Results Through Teamwork Awards. Congratulations on your, your awards. Uh, you are now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Katko, Ranking Member Watson Coleman, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on TSA's pre-check program and airport wait times. My statement's primarily based on our February 2018 report. 43,000 transportation security officers, TSOs, across 440 airports screen 2 million or more passengers and their baggage each day. 
TSA's primary responsibility is to ensure security, but it also strives to balance safety with the efficient flow of passengers through the screening process. An inherent challenge in TSA's mission is taking the time necessary to do the job right and moving passengers through as quickly as possible. With an increasing number of travelers and the busy 2018 travel season underway, it is critical that TSA get this balance right. The TSA standard for wait times is under 30 minutes for standard screening and under 15 minutes for pre-check or expedited screening. Our review of airport passenger wait time data from 2015 to 2017 showed that TSA met those standards 99% of the time. We found that TSA collected data to monitor passenger wait times and throughput and had tools to respond to increases when necessary. In particular, TSA's Airport Operations Center, AOC, monitored wait times and passenger throughput hourly from 28 airports that make up the majority of passenger throughput nationwide. Our analysis showed the value of TSA collecting and monitoring near real-time data. For example, prior to this approach, during the spring of 2016, we found that long screening queues in excess of 30 minutes occurred across those 28 busy airports. The AOC was created during that period in May 2016 to help address wait time issues. Since then, each operational hour, wait times are collected in all open lanes at the 28 airports and reported hourly to the AOC. The AOC also holds a daily conference call with key stakeholders such as airlines and airport officials to help identify challenges. The net result is that wait times average below 30 minutes um, at the 28 airports from June 2016 to May 2017. To better manage long lines, we found federal security directors at airports noted they can use a number of tools such as overtime and moving TSOs from less busy lanes to congested ones. Effective use of expedited screening or pre-check can also impact wait times. Since pre-check passengers are considered low risk and require less screening, increases in pre-check enrollment allow TSA to screen passengers more quickly. Over 2014 and 2015, however, GAO and the DHS OIG reported concerns about the security effectiveness with a pre-check process called managed inclusion in which standard screening passengers are randomly selected for pre-check. In response, in November 2015, TSA modified its risk assessment rules for pre-check, which reduced the number of passengers automatically designated as low risk. TSA also significantly reduced its use of managed inclusion. Currently, TSA only uses managed inclusion at airports where passenger screening K-9 teams are available, but has otherwise discontinued it. TSA also re recently implemented our 2015 recommendation to ensure an effectiveness study for the remaining managed inclusion process known as K-9 expedited screening followed best practices for its design and reliability. In conclusion, TSA has taken positive steps to ensure it has near real-time passenger wait time data to quickly identify and address long queues at the security checkpoints and has taken action to improve the security effectiveness of its expedited screening program. But continued attention is needed to these issues uh, in order to avoid problems encountered in 2016 and to successfully manage the summer travel season. Chairman Katko, Ranking Member Watson-Coleman, this concludes my prepared statement, and I look forward to your questions. Mr. Russell, you beat Mr. LaJoy. You guys are on a roll today. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your, your comments and look forward to your testimony. Um, the Chair Nutton now recognized myself for five minutes of questions, and uh, I'll, I'll pose this to both of you because I'd, I'd appreciate both your takes on this. Uh, I'd like to know, uh, uh, well, a couple things, first of all, concerns that I have. And I've articulated these concerns, and they're nothing new, but um, two things. One is the goal has always been to get pre-check around 20 million people, and it really seems to have slowed down. Um, we were at 1 million uh, several years ago, and it bumped up pretty quickly, and then it's kind of plateaued off to some extent. It seems like it's going a little bit better. I know in the Syracuse Airport, once we got a kiosk there, uh, we went from a very small percentage on uh, pre-check to more than 50% of the travelers on pre-check. So um, I'd like to hear both of your takes on pre-check, but I'd also like to hear both of your takes on um, pre-check as, as a form of what you just mentioned, Mr. Russell, managed inclusion, which we made emphatically clear uh, last Congress that shouldn't be taking place anymore, and it's still taking place at TSA. And the concerns we had back then about managed inclusion was that they are not, it's not risk-based security. It's, it's, it's just moving people through. Now we understand, and that's what the genesis of this hearing is today, is 
to have a discussion about are you ready for this crush coming this summer? But as a backdrop to that, I don't want it to be an over-reliance on managed inclusion type practices, which we are going to end by law, because that's the only way I think we're gonna be able to stop you guys from doing it. So, uh, and we're gonna set a, we're gonna give you a time limit in the bill that we get passed that says, uh, after this time, no more of this stuff, because we can't have it. It's, it's, a, it's a security gap in our minds. And, we're, and uh, we've asked you many times not to, and you still do it, so now we're gonna tell you by law you can't. So um, with that being as, as a backdrop, I'd like to, hear about that, but I'd also like to hear about your interactions with respect to industry. So there's a lot in there. So let's hear about pre-check and, and managed inclusion, and then let's hear about uh, um, your interactions with industry about anticipating some of the wait time issues that might, that might materialize this summer. So Mr. Chairman, one, one of the things we're, we've acknowledged is that currently we have about two out of 10 passengers enrolled in pre-check, and we really think that needs to be closer to about four out of 10. Um, now, that may seem like a fairly modest goal, but we also understand that because of the frequency by which these are business travelers and leisure enthusiasts, they represent far and away the majority of all the passengers. And we still think, we're still convinced that there's about 66% of these people still aren't enrolled in these. So we've really focused on a couple of different key areas. Um, the first is just the fantastic partnership we have with industry. Um, if you get on an airplane today, you're going to see pre-check marketing materials available in in-flight entertainment systems and in in-flight magazines. You'll see our bookmarks um, and, and the seat backs, as well as a number of companies that are making this part of the rewards programs for, for banks and et cetera, credit card companies. Um, recently, our, our vendor has announced that state 50 Staples locations throughout the country, they'll have TSA enrollment centers present. We also understand that one of the biggest barriers to enrollment is simply going to where the enrollment center is. We have 350 enrollment centers around the country, 41 of which are in airports. And I think that's where the partnership we have with CBP is so critically important in both at the very senior levels of both agencies, we're looking very aggressively at where we can look at combining both enrollment centers as well as uh, combining a common portal where you know somebody can go to one online system and, and sign up for either TSA PreCheck or or Global Entry. Um, so we think in, in total, the things are going to have a positive impact in growing the PreCheck populations. Uh, if uh, Syracuse can maybe use this as an example, like I said. Once you put it, and they used to be up in Oswego, which is 45 minutes north. You had to drive up on crappy roads just to get to the Border Patrol station to sign up for pre-check. When they got it in the airport, it went up to more than 50% of the passengers. I don't understand why they don't just put it at airports. I, again, Mr. I think that's, that's something that we agree we're looking very closely at. I think both TSA and CBP can um, rely on efficiencies in, in this, as well as making the process much more seamless for the traveling public. That's absolutely something we're endeavoring towards. Okay, and lastly, just quickly then, I wanna hear from Mr. Russell. Um, what have you done to interact with the uh, private sector to anticipate wait times this summer? Well, uh, yeah, so, I mean, any success we're now having is because of partnerships with industry. Just the sophistication we see in our models is because we have near constant communication with the airlines, we get their volume forecasts. In advance of the summer, I was just last week um, meeting with a number of the associations as well as the airlines. Over the next two weeks, I've got meetings planned with all the major air, air carriers to go over their hub operations, make sure that we absolutely have the very best plan, you know, given some of the schedules that they're seeing. So very intense folks on working directly with both the associations, the airports, and the air carriers. Yeah, it's a critical, because I think Memorial Day weekend's right around the corner. Yes, sir. And I know that because I have about 15 parades that weekend. But uh, from your standpoint, it's a high travel time, so I, I hope you get with them. So Mr. Russell, please, uh, your, your response? Certainly, just to pick up on the coordination with industry stakeholders, that's one thing we saw in our recent report that um, especially the daily conference, call, conference calls that are held now between some of those stakeholders and uh, the airport operations center, it's a chance to surface challenges that may be emerging and help to um, address those. Uh, so we receive positive feedback both from the FSDs we talked to as well as some of the key industry stakeholders. Uh, transitioning to pre-check, certainly uh, going through the, the known enrollment or, or the known travelers and increasing the enrollment process is, is the key. Those are the trusted travelers that have had the most vetting. Um, so the closer TSA can get to that uh, 25 million goal by 2020, uh, the better. Uh, is, is that achievable? I mean, that, it would be awesome if they did it, but is that really realistic? When we, back, when we last calculated the numbers back in December 2018, it, it, it seemed it was about 1.9 million applicants 
uh, or enrollees. And then when you counted the uh, trusted traveler groups, that brought it up to about 8.8 .8 million. So that has been an ongoing challenge to go from that level up to the, the 25 million target. What do you think needs to be done? We haven't looked specifically at that issue, but, but certainly whatever you can do to make that process easier um, and to, to vet and encourage the, the groups like active military, DOD civilians to take advantage of that opportunity, the better. What, what if, what if at, uh, there's 450 airports nationwide, what if at the vast majority of airports they had a kiosk, what do you think that would do? I'm not sure. We didn't look specifically at that. I think it would blow the lid off it. I think, yeah, I think you'd get a lot more people signing up. It's pretty simple to me. Mm -hmm. um, all right, anything else, sir? Uh, just one thing on the managed inclusion. That's something uh, in our past work we've had concerns as well. Um, our understanding now is that has been limited to passenger screening canine teams. Um, in our most recent work, the FSTs pointed that that was a very effective way to help manage the queues. Um, our recommendation along those lines was basically to do a study to look at the security effectiveness of that process, and our understanding is TSA has done that. You know, I fully believe in the canine, the canine process, and Mr. Rogers told me I had to. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, but I fully believe in it, but I do think that when you pay for a service, and that service is based on risk-based security, that people shouldn't be coming into that and uh, you know, violating that service area because, first of all, it's, it's not right. But second of all, far more importantly, from a security standpoint, uh, we are diminishing our security. So the canines serve a great role, but they, you know, they should not replace uh, pre-check because a canine can't go back and do a background check on you. They can make sure you're not carrying something on you shouldn't, but we all know there's diversified threats now. So have the whole basis of pre-check is risk-based security and known, knowing the person before they get, get to the step foot at the airport. That's the whole idea of it. And we are violating that, that whole notion when we just let people go to pre-check lanes under any circumstances, so it's gotta end. And I, I'm pretty sure I made myself clear on that. The chair the char now recognizes the ranking member, Ms. watson Coleman, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much. Um, I have three lines of question, actually all addressing a TSA specifically. I'm gonna to try to get through them as quickly as possible, so I'm gonna ask you if you could respond as concisely as possible. The first one is, in, in 2016, this has to do with um, increasing the number of people who are enrolled in pre-check. In 2016, TSA withdrew a solicitation for, in, for the industry to propose new ways to enroll passengers in pre-check, citing cybersecurity concerns. Now, I heard what you said about some of the increased activity that you have had with industry, but I'd like to know, uh, does TSA plan to issue a new solicitation specifically on this issue? And if so, when? And um, how does TSA plan to increase enrollments and participation in pre-check? So, ma'am, with respect to the RFP, we did cancel the TSA expansion RFP back in, citing the concerns, as you, as you pointed out. Um, that's been replaced by the UES, which is our universal enrollment system. Your universal who? Universal, universal enrollment system. So it would be, it would be uh -huh. ac across okay. all of our vetting, with TSA PreCheck, um, Hazard, you know, HME, as well as TWIC. That solicitation period is over. We are in sort of the evaluating these okay. things, and we hope to uh, award this this fall. Okay, you have any idea what, when you all are going to be making a, a decision as to where to go in this? This fall, ma'am. This fall, I'm this sorry fall. to hear you. Okay, thank you. So taking you back to the New York Times article about this, 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 some, some kind of checklist that you all watch list, secret watch list that you all are supposed to um, have, um, could you please tell me more about the list, including how many people are currently on it and what security purposes it serves? And can you please provide me with the, with the directive that initiated it, any official communications regarding such a list? And does TSA maintain any other watch list? So that's like three quick questions. Yes, ma'am. So we'll pro provide back for the record the actual directive themselves as they are, you know, the directive. security information. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, the, the, there are less than 50 people on this list. And the intent was we were seeing an, an alarming increase in the number of assaults against our officers. Um, so this is, there is no additional screening being applied to these individuals. It simply means to communicate that uh, a passenger may be arriving to the airport and they've either demonstrated a history of assaulting officers or in trying to circumvent some sort of security procedure. So uh, 
no additional screening, but it does give the local federal security directors a heads up that somebody transiting the airport has demonstrated a history of, of okay. unsafe or you know behavior that would have us concerned. All right, so I'll look forward to the kind of directive which yes, would help me understand. But um, do, are there any other such secret wait lists, that, watch lists that you will have? Uh, again, outside of the general list that we have with respect to somebody who would be on a no-fly list, but, okay. but no. And again, this, this list is not about, this is different because this, uh, this applies no additional screening to this individual. It's simply an awareness that mm -hmm. somebody is going through the checkpoint that has demonstrated concerning, you know, assaultive behavior in the past to our officers. So it's like, be prepared. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in what resources that you don't have that you may need. Um, particularly, do you think that there is a need for additional officers to be able to respond to what's going to be this spike in travel? If so, uh, how many? And um, well, let's deal with that first. Well, well ma'am, I think our level of sophistication in the model has been described as allowed us to really leverage resources that we have. So, so this summer, we really measure the peak from mid-July to mid-July. So if you go back from our peak from last summer, we have fully 16 to 1,800 more mm -hmm. TSOs than we did just last summer, in addition to 50 more passenger screening canines. We've increased overtime use by almost 5%, so we really think that we are in the best position we've ever been in response to what is to be a 4% growth from last year. So then you year. don't think that there's any lack of um, human personnel that you need no, in addition to what you no, I, mean, I, I honestly think that you know, given what we put in place for the summer and the partnership with the airlines and airports, that we are as prepared as we've ever been uh -huh. um, to meet the demands. If you go back to our spring break, the last holiday season, in addition to last summer, mm -hmm. um, we've really you know, limited any yeah. sort of impact to the airports. So kind of last question with, with regard to this. Um, how is your retention rate with, with officers? Uh, how's, the, how's, how's the morale <coughs> and what is being done to sort of deal with the fact that these individuals are sort of outside of the mainstream of how they can move through the system and move up? Are we doing anything about it? Well, thank you for that question. And, and, and again, the morale of our workforce is something that the administrator and all the leadership at TSA pay you know, very close attention to. And having been out there in the field, I understand full well you know, the importance of the job that they do. So there's a number of things that, that we put in place. You know, having heard from the workforce, there's a lot of stress in how they were getting their annual tests. Um, it was sort of, it was in a room that was wholly different than what their day-to-day -day experiences are. And so the administrators put change, wholesale changes to the annual testing for officers, much more realistic. Their direct leadership chain is absolutely involved in this process now. In addition, the administrators laid out a, a plan because our officers are being asked to operate exceedingly um, advanced technology. Uh, in, in addition to going down to Federal Law Enforcement Training Center to receive a lot of di additional training. And as our officers are acquiring this new training, he wants to be able to tie the award money to getting those additional skills. And, and lastly, what we also know from our officers is that they want to have confidence that they have the very best technology out there to do their job, which is why, you know, the support from the committee as well as the administrator in getting computer tomography out there, advanced screen lanes, you know, those are all important things that give our workforce confidence, I think, improve morale. Absolutely, and it's also important that they're being paid fair wages, that they have uh, access to benefits and pensions and, and moving up, and that they have uh, a system that allows them to express their concerns and have it dealt with. So we are, we are all moving in the right direction, got a lot more to do. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Watson Coleman. Uh, the, now, the chair now recognizes a gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Rogers, for five minutes of questioning. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to ask, um, you talked about having 50 more canine teams this July than you had last July. Uh, how many do you need? Well, again, right now we're authorized 372. We've seen about 180% increase in program over the next couple of years. So we've really been um, doubling down on our efforts in, in Lackland to make sure we have adequate training and kennel space. It's one of the things we're looking very closely at as we start getting new technology, um, number of officers, how we balance that against the, the canine. That'll be an important part of what our future budget missions look like. Do you have enough to cover the Category X airports? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and what is next as far as your 
uh, expansion of that capability? Well, I think right now, sir, I, one of the areas we're focusing on is this third-party canine for use in the cargo operations. And so we think that shows a lot of promise for, we've been working very closely with industry with that. Um, and again, looking at the precision of our model to how we incorporate how canines can fold into that, I think is really, really important. So from my perspective, the next evolution of how we sort of staff airports needs to include how we're utilizing canines so that we can really sit down and make sure we're projecting an adequate number of canines for future budget years. Uh, well, I saw an FY19 budget you're uh, saying that it supports uh, 1,047 canine teams, but that includes uh, state and locals, which make up two-thirds of that. Tell me how you use the state and local teams. Well, they're, they're critically important to us. I mean, as you pointed out correctly, I mean, fully two-thirds of those teams are from our state and local partners. Are they, are they explosive detection canines? Yes, sir. Are they trained through the Lackland program or a similar program? Th those are all TSA dogs, sir. So, yes, they really provide a lot of this, you know, public area, you know, patrolling, unattended bags in airports. We work very closely. Um, issues in cargo warehouses. We really rely heavily on our state and local partners with the use of the canines to, to mitigate some of the public areas of the airports. When, do, have y'all made a determination as to when you will achieve the threshold of canine teams that you feel are adequate to meet the national needs? I, I think what is that number? I, I still think that's something we're looking at. So I, I, yeah. I, again, that's really the next evolution of where I think we take our staffing and scheduling models is that, you know, we're still fairly new to the passenger screening business. As you pointed out, about one third of the teams are in use in passenger screening. Um, so as we mature our model, we really have to understand with new technology, how many dogs we think we really, really need to manage the airports. Uh, describe for me exactly what canine expedited screening is. Is that managed inclusion? N no, sir. Uh, um, how does it differ? Again, as described earlier, the managed inclusion, too, that was in use, you know, several years ago involved the use of the BDOs, and it was very correctly pointed out, a randomizer of some such. Um, our use of the dogs is enhanced screening. Um, again, we believe very well that the dogs are very effective in, as a deterrent as well as for sniffing for explosives. And so we... We are very confident that when the dogs are in use, that substantially mitigated many of the concerns that we have, and we feel that we can afford those passengers, all of whom have been screened for explosives, a more expedited process of going through the checkpoint. However, we view dogs as an additional layer of security, well, not a replacement for anything. Well, I want to ask you, you said those passengers. You mean those passengers who are not pre-check or in another trusted traveler program? The passengers that are screened by the canines, sir. Are not part of the trusted traveler system. So I guess it would be any, any right now we use the canines to screen any passengers going through the checkpoint. That may in fact be folks that are already involved in TSA trusted traveler programs or standard passengers who've not been enrolled. We okay. believe again that we may see a dog either screening passengers who are enrolled or passengers who are not because we view that's them as an additional layer of security, not a yeah. replacement. Yeah, and that's the thing that, that I think we were concerned about coming in today is, is uh, we had the uh, perception that y'all may have developed a new category where you were going to just use the canines as the primary uh, layer. And it should just be one of several layers that you have employed to make sure that these folks that don't need to be putting bad things on airplanes uh, are able to do it. Yes, sir, and we agree. Let me ask this, uh, Mr. Russell. You made the point, you said canine expedited screening does meet best practices standard. Is that accurate? the design of the study that they did to determine the effectiveness of that approach. You felt like that, does, that was designed right. to be in an effective way. We had concerns an initially measure, that, I guess. that it wasn't going to align with um, things like randomizing the airport selected and sort of the scope of the review. Um, and TSA took action to, to make sure that the study they did conduct met uh, the, okay, that sort of criteria. Uh, and last question I had was, Mr. LaJoy, you said uh, about 66% of the people that you believe should be enrolled in PreCheck uh, are not. And, and did I understand that you think the reason why is because it's just inconvenient for them to find a location to, to sign up? That's not the $100 fee, it's just the inconvenience? The $85 fee, sir. I, I, we really honestly think that the biggest barrier to is just the enrollment process finding a place to go and enroll. That's what some of our market research says. We really think there's still lots of opportunities, even for those folks who fly five, five to 15 times a year, which would really be for that, ta that target passenger segmentation. We really think there's still a lot of room for us to target those people for full-time enrollment. Yeah, I, I agree. I, when I entered global entry, uh, when I to go and do the interview part, 
you know, I had to go to the Atlanta airport to the farthest terminal. It was very inconvenient to do that. I, I do think that more people would go into that, which would get them into pre-check, if we could find a way to make those interviews more convenient because all the questionings are done online. Uh, yes, sir. And, and in fact, one of the things, we're, we're coming up on the five-year period for folks who sign up for pre-check very early on. And so we're putting forth a plan for those passengers to do so online without having to go back to an enrollment center. So we also think that's important in keeping people that are enrolled, keeping them enrolled. Right, right. Um, and, and again, pointing back to the really, really critical work we're doing in CBP, because we all agree that if we can merge programs at enrollment sites and an online portal, we really think that's going to have a positive impact on the passenger and, and a positive impact on the overall our growth of all DHS trusted driver programs. Right. Thank you. I yield back. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, before we go to the next question, I just want to note that uh, former Secretary of Homeland Security, Mr. Johnson, is here today, and we saw him walk in, so welcome. Uh, it's very strange not to see you at the witness table, so uh, <laughs> I, I, I imagine that's the case, so uh, welcome. And I will just make one quick observation uh, that I made, two, two observations. One is, if it's a question of convenience, put the kiosks at the airports and this for, for pre-check. And the second thing is that um, uh, without betraying classified information, we know that there are some materials of a non-explosive nature that are considered a lethal threat now that we have to account for. Uh, and, and I'm not sure the canines weren't gonna be trained on that. If they, they have to be trained on that if that's the case. So we have to keep that in mind as well. And that's yet another reason why only pre-check should be pre-check. Uh, with that, I, I'd like to welcome Mr. Estes from uh, Kansas for five minutes of questions. I'm sorry, Mr. Keening for five minutes of questions, excuse me, from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's great to see uh, you here, Mr. Secretary, again. Uh, Mr. LaJoy, thank you. And uh, as a Celtics fan, uh, it's always great to have, it gives me a great feeling that anyone named Bill Russell is in front of us. So uh, thank you, Mr. Russell, as well. Now, listen, just a couple of quick follow ups. Uh, uh, that uh, list you have, uh, that was the 95 list, I guess it was called in the Times, or it's under 50 people. Uh, there's no reason uh, any employee should ever have to put up with assault, particularly in such a, a stressful job. And it uh, gives me a, a time to comment on how great my experience has been seeing those people work under tough conditions. But uh, I want to just see, those 50 people, or under 50 people, do they know they're on this list? I'm not sure if they do or not, sir. But again, any passenger would have the right to go back through DHS trip, you know, if they want. But, but they don't know if they're on the list. So I would think it'd be more effective if these people, as a deterrent, uh, knew they were on the list. I think, I think you should, should, you know, look into that. Yes, because sir. if you're going to, you know, affect behavior, it'd be great that they knew in the list, and it'd be great if they're on the list they, if they had a way to appeal that in case uh, there's a subjective determination. If someone's hanging, I hang around the uh, security uh, lines before I jump in sometimes too. And I tend to walk in circles on the phone, so I don't, I don't want to end up in the list either. So if I, if I could, sir, I, I would, that's really not the, what, what the intent of the program is for. It's not for somebody who, these are people that have demonstrated in the past their, their willingness okay, I understand. To, to I just bypass. want to get on to another question, but yes, sir. The, the good thing is, I think if they know they're in the list, you might affect behavior better yes. in the future. And the best thing to do for employees is uh, not to have them su subject to it at all. So th that is the thing. I, I'm curious, uh, on, on the subject of another list, the, the, I'm on counterterrorism, I'm ranking on terrorism and foreign affairs, but uh, how are you doing with the uh, FBI no-fly list? How's that functioning? Any problems with that lately? No, sir. So. No mistakes, no, because you'd be on the, you'd know, you're in the receiving end of this. And yeah, from my perspective, it's working quite well. So good, good to know that. FBI, when we have gun issues uh, that are in front of us about people that uh, uh, can get explosives legally or a gun legally, uh, and they're on the terrorist watch list that you say now is running so well, it's great to know because the criticism for those people that oppose that is saying, wow, it's a mess and we, it's not functioning well, so we have to, be careful of their rights. So glad to hear it from your account. You said in your testimony, uh, Mr. LaJoy, that uh, some of the revenues will help address the shortfalls. I uh, just want to make sure uh, you said they're help, uh, but if we could, that implies that if you had more resources, you could do a little better uh, this summer in particular when things spike. Any comments? 
Well, well sir, what I'd I just want to qualify your words. Yeah, well, so what I'd point out is one of the things that we're very aware of is that about 45% of the largest airports, they have one or more checkpoints that are capacity constrained. So there are a number of places where even if we had more officers, it's not likely to mitigate sort of any wait time issues, which is why the work we're doing with the airports is so important. So as, as they are expanding the airports, we're monitoring those things very, very closely. But for, for this summer, with fully 1,600 more officers than last summer, I, I really do honestly feel that we were in the best position to meet this summer demand. Yeah, we had a meeting with some of the airline industry, I think last year too. Uh, one of the things that's difficult, uh, that makes your job difficult is the configuration of the airports themselves. They're different. Uh, anything that can be done uh, to help along those lines or anything we could do? This is a good chance for you to uh, reach out for some help from us. Uh, I'll give a lot of the, the airports a lot of credit. They are wholly involved. I, I know of virtually no airport that's not in the middle of major construction to make sure that they are, in fact, adding capacity. A number of the airports and airlines, you know, especially for the summer, are getting their employees out there to make sure they're communicating with passengers if there has been a change. So, and that's also, I think, shows the sophistication of our model, because one of the things we now do is making sure at the design phase, we are meeting with airports early on to know that in three years, in two years, if they are planning for additional lanes, we make sure we can account for those things in some of our future budget submissions. So, great work, great partnership with the airports themselves on that. Okay. I'll, I'll follow up with some written questions, yes, uh, but uh, I do thank you for your work. It's a tough job, uh, and the people that work for you, uh, I think, do very well, uh, and it should be said from time to time. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Keating. The chair now recognizes Mr. Esses from Kansas for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we, we've talked about TSA pre-check enrollment, and uh, I, I would agree that part of the, the, uh, the delay in people uh, signing up uh, is uh, because of the inconvenience of going to a location. And, and using myself as an example, uh, I was one of those travelers that was probably traveling five times a, a year uh, before I came into this role a year ago. And uh, at that point in time, the, the other motivating factor, in addition to the inconvenience of having to go to a location to sign up for, for TSA PreCheck, was roughly half the time when I went to the airport for one of those five flights, I was automatically put into TSA PreCheck. And I think that's also one of those factors that's really leading to uh, a slow decline in the, in the or a, a not, not a growth in the number of people that are enrolled. And I, I know we've talked about it here multiple times about that, and I, I just, I just wanted to emphasize that that's something we need to uh, we need to keep pushing because I think that's, if not as important, it is it is also a mitigating factor, and I don't know if that's part of what you're looking at as well, and that's kind of why we're pushing forward to, to eliminate that practice. It, it is. It's something that we agree. This is more of a natural evolution of what pre-check looks like, um, and, and I remember well the experience from 2016. So I, I think it's important that we sort of balance the capacity constraints of the airports, um, the growth of the TSA, Trusted Travel Programs, in addition to what that staffing looks like. But I, but I do agree that it's something we have to, to very, very closely consider given what um, we're facing in the world today. We really don't want to, you know, result in large crowds of people being in front of the airports. But, but I agree fully and understand the committee's concern with this. and It's something we're very much focused on trying to improve. Okay, let me ask another question, and we, we've we've uh, talked about this already to some degree, uh, just the, as we enter into the peak summer travel season, and and talked about some of the things we want to do. But I just wanted to see if maybe you could recap what the activities that you're expecting to to do that would help mitigate that to make sure that that's the that's the plan you have. So compared to last summer, sir, we've increased overtime by by five percent across the board. Um, we fully have between 14 and 1,600 additional officers than we did last summer, in addition to 50 more passenger screening canines. And one of the other things that we've done, I think, to go back to show, demonstrate the maturity of our modeling is the federal security directors themselves, having been one, this is very close to me, they have much more flexibility in how they utilize their own resources. They can decide at what rate they want to have part-time versus full-time. They can decide at what rate that they want to increase their overtime within their budgets. There are a number of airports that we also know we have a, a, a difficult time competing just to attract new talent. So in some of these airports, we've increased, we've put our human capital folks in place for rapid hiring. We are onboarding double what we were. We're onboarding almost 600 additional officers a pay period. 
Um, and there are some places where we are really having a difficult time. We've offered some temporary incentives to attract people to come work for TSA. So it's really been a concerted effort over many, many months to make sure that everybody, all the leadership at TSA, is focused on supporting those front lines in addition to the great partnership we've been having with the airports and the airlines. So I, I guess my only comment that I would add to that is, is um, what I've seen over the last few months, I, I think the, the wait times are relatively fine in most of the, the airports that I've, I've flown through. Uh, but my concern is as we, we increase the peak travel amounts that we're going to run into problems with that. So I wanted to make sure that uh, those uh, activities got engaged and, and done in time for us to use this summer. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Estes. The chair now recognizes for some follow-up questions Mr. Rogers from Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to <laughs> try to be clear. <laughs> I'm still not clear on the K-9 expedited screening uh, and its, its application. My understanding was that you were using it for people who were not in pre-check, that you needed to move a little faster, but they were going through the standard screening, but in kind of an expedited lane, as long as canines were added as a layer to that lane. Is that not what it is? It is that, sir. So, so again, any passenger today, any passenger going through the checkpoint could be sub subject to passenger screening canine. That could be somebody, we could have a, a canine being used to screen passengers that are already enrolled in TSA pre-check because right. in our view, it's, it's an additional and I, and I argue it should be. I think yes, that sir. everybody should be. Yes, sir. But, but how does this get the term expedited? Uh, how, how does that become applicable? If you're in, if, uh, assuming you're not a pre-check traveler, my understanding is that's what you're trying to expedite is the people who are not pre-check passengers. And I think that, that that's fair, sir. So there's a number of ways you could go through an airport in an expedited manner. You could be you know, somebody who's enrolled in a trusted traveler population. You're going through a dedicated pre-check lane. In addition, on the standard lanes, any passenger with whom they've gone past the dogs, and, and we know they've been screened for explosives, um, they go through the checkpoint at a similar configuration what a pre-check lane would be. So that, that's really how we... That's Okay. Okay. That, I, I'm with you now. Thank you. Okay. I just, I wasn't clear. <laughs> Sorry, that's probably me, sir. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Mr. Rogers. I just want to make sure I'm clear on the follow-up question now. I, I was in Fort Myers, and uh, the line was very long, and they, the canines were there, and they were putting everybody through the pre-check lane. The lane was set, pre-check, and everybody was going through the pre-check lane. So um, I'm not sure that's uniform throughout the country, and then I'm sure that may not be the intent, but it's pretty clear to me that um, there is um, uh, people that are not in pre-check that are going into pre-check once they go by a K-9. Isn't that correct? That is correct, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Well, I appreciate both your testimonies. Um, I would encourage you to stay for the second panel just so you can hear what they have to say about their concerns on wait times this summer. But I do appreciate uh, everything you're doing. Um, you have a very difficult job, and uh, I commend you for doing it. And I also... I would be remiss if I didn't commend uh, a shout out to all the, the, the officers on the front lines throughout the country who do a very difficult job and they don't get paid a ton of money. And uh, there's an awful lot of pride that I see, uh, especially when I go through Syracuse and the airports, I get to know the people. The level of professionalism is pretty, pretty substantial. So you should all be congratulated for that. They're, doing, they're trying to find the needle in the haystack every minute of every day. Like I tell my scheduler, you only notice you're doing, uh, and you only notice what's going on if you do something wrong as a scheduler. And it's the same thing with, a, it's, uh, with, a, with, a, with the front lines there. I mean, you, you won't know unless they're doing something wrong, unless something that a tragedy strikes. And it's a pretty stressful situation for them. But they do a wonderful job, and they should be commended for that. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you both for your professionalism today. And I hope you stick around for the second panel. We'll take a brief adjournment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, right. It's about as sharp as a marble. I don't understand. Because well, like, that's what bothered me when I was in, when I was in Fort Myers.
Okay, we're back on the record. Um, I'd like to welcome our second panel today for today's hearing. Our first witness is Ms. Lorraine Howerton, the Senior Director of Government Relations for the U.S. Travel Association. In this position, she's responsible for outreach to advance U.S. travel's legislative priorities in Congress and for representing the organization on the Aviation Security Advisory Committee, which has really turned into a wonderful organization doing a lot of good work. Previously, Ms. Howerton served as Vice President for Legislative Affairs for the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, where she spearheaded the creation of the Congressional General Aviation Caucus. Ms. Howerton is now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Katko and uh, members of the committee. Is this better? Oh, much better. Good morning, Chairman Katko and members of the committee. It's my pleasure to uh, offer testimony to, uh, for you this morning. And thank you for the opportunity to allow me to testify on behalf of the U.S. Travel Association. U.S. Travel is the national nonprofit organization representing more than 1,200 member organizations across all sectors of the travel industry that generates $2.4 trillion in economic output and supports 15.6 million American jobs. TSA PreCheck has been a major breakthrough in providing optimum security and improving the travel experience. Today, PreCheck is an established program that is available at more than 200 airports with 52 participating airlines, yet enrollment is stagnant. Approximately 6 million people are enrolled and another 2 million have PreCheck as a result of global entry. Efforts to continue the program's expansion should be a priority for TSA and its expansion should focus on four areas which we refer to as the four P's, process, promotion, price, and prioritization. We urge the Trump administration and Congress to place a renewed focus on refining and enhancing the program to increase participation, particularly making enrollment more convenient without sacrificing security. U.S. Travel offers the following recommendations that would further improve PreCheck, protect traveler privacy, and give the American people the best return on their investments of traveler fees. We recommend that TSA analyze and develop a process for spontaneous enrollment. Too often, the current requirement for two forms of identification is a significant barrier to travelers enrolling in the program and a modification to only one document would make it easier for people to spontaneously enroll. A real ID driver's license is an example how one document can serve the security purposes for enrolling in PreCheck. We also recommend offering volume discounts as financial incentive or a cost break to large companies to help spark more volume enrollments. The upfront cost of an $85 enrollment fee multiplied by thousands of employees is a measurable and significant cost with harder to measure returns. Providing quantity discounts to corporate travel managers, especially those who supply applicants to TSA for on-site enrollment may create more corporate interest. Helping families also is warranted and we encourage TSA and its partners at OMB to reconsider the rule for children and explore a subscription model for fees that would be paid on an annual basis, not five years at a time. While younger children, 12 and under, are allowed to join a parent in pre-check, older children cannot. The one-time cost of enrolling family of five may be a significant factor for many families and deter enrollment. As it relates to checkpoint efficiency, and as we head into one of the heaviest travel seasons, we know it is extremely important not to have long wait times, and we know that TSA mitigates the ebb and flow of peak travel by deploying various techniques to safely move people. One of the techniques is managed inclusion, or as we heard today, enhanced inclusion in the pre-check lanes. Blending of populations confuses the traveling public, aggravates pre-check customers, and diminishes the value of the program to both the government and the traveler. We understand that managed inclusion is being phased out. However, phasing out managed inclusion without phasing in other strategies and screening techniques to maintain efficiency will only lead to longer lines and new frustrations. We hope TSA develops a plan to solve the problem rather than opting to trade one set of problems for a different set. Another recommendation we make is for Congress to help TSA get rid of the roadblocks in expanding the number of third-party pre-screening companies. Currently, there is one company. Having multiple companies will drive competition, reduce costs, 
and help grow enrollment. Lastly, I would be remiss if I did not remind this good committee that one third of airline passenger fees collected are being diverted from TSA aviation security screening to the general fund until 2025. Comparing 2013 to 2017, travelers paid two billion more in fees. 3.9 billion versus 1.9 billion for the exact same service. Revenue raised from aviation security fees should go towards securing travelers, not to deficit reduction. We support solutions to repeal the current diversion. This concludes my statement, and I would look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Ms. Howerton. I appreciate your testimony. You made some great points. We'll, we'll follow up on. Uh, uh, and I'm glad that the, the TSA has remained here, so they're hearing it as well. And I thank you for staying and taking the time. Um, our second witness is Ms. Sharon Pinkerton, the Senior Vice President of Legislative and Regulatory Policy for Airlines for America. In this position, Ms. Pinkerton leads policy development on legislative and regulatory matters, working closely with Capitol Hill and the administration. Before joining A4A, she served as an assistant administrator for aviation policy, planning, and environment at the Federal Aviation Administration. Prior to her time at the FAA, she served as transportation counsel to House Aviation Subcommittee Chairman John Micah. You're dating yourself. Just <laughs> Ms. Pinkerton is now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Katko. We appreciate, thank you so much, Chairman Katko. We appreciate the opportunity to be here today um, to talk to you about these important issues. Um, my, my real message to you all today is really to say thank you. I think that as a result of your work, TSA's work together, uh, partnering with airlines and airports, we are cautiously optimistic that TSA is ready for the summer travel. 4% growth, it's significant. Now, the reason for the caution and in my optimism is that we haven't forgotten what happened in 2016. We've talked about it here today. There was a terrible uh, DHS IG report. Um, TSA ratcheted uh, the dials on the security equation in one way without adjusting staffing and other processes. And we did end up with three-hour wait times, and I think that's something none of us want. Um, so our lesson learned is that Actions have consequences. Um, now, that's why, Chairman Kaka, we're supporting your idea of transitioning away from using canines and rules to put non pre check passengers into the pre check lane, as long as that's coupled with the other side of the security equation, which is, as we discussed, getting more people into the pre check lane. Or this other idea that I'd like to start putting on the table, which is having another vetting procedure in place that will enable some form of known travelers to have a different experience, not necessarily the pre-check experience, but a risk-based security experience. Said another way, I think we have to start by understanding that staffing isn't the be-all and end-all. It's one very important part of the puzzle commend TSA for getting us up to somewhere between 600, 1,600 more F FTEs year over year. But it's really important that we actually look at this as a process and improving our security processes and very importantly, deploy deploying better technology. So it's with that big picture that we're making the following recommendations. I want to talk about pre-check first. If we all agree that we don't want to put non pre check passengers into the pre check lane, the question that's still on the table is how do we get those pre check numbers up? We are not on a path right now to meet the 25 million that TSA had. First, I think we all need to recognize that for some reason, despite Chairman Katko's legislation and the legislation embraced by this subcommittee, the third party enrollment program has not delivered. I'm not quite sure how it's gotten all bollocked up, but I think you need to get to the bottom of that. What I'd like to think about is what, what can we do, putting that aside for, for the moment? We heard Darby mention it a little bit. TSA and CBP need to merge their trusted traveler programs. We've got two programs out there, two sets of infrastructure, two sets of locations. We need to merge those where it makes sense. Instead of having TSA and CBP compete, Let's combine resources and have one simple, easy to use application process. I think that working together, TSA and CBP are gonna be able to make signing up more accessible. Darby mentioned moving toward mobile 
enrollment, we should be there today. We're living in a mobile society. There's no reason for us not to have mobile enrollment. Let's make those enrollment centers more location friendly and not so far away. And the schedule needs to be something other than eight to four. All the ideas that Lorraine talked about, about some fee incentives for families and big groups make a lot of sense. Let's move on to some other ideas. We believe that if Congress truly believes that 99% or let's even say 95% of the traveling public is not the problem, we're really looking for that small percentage of people that are a problem. We need to start thinking differently about the, pre, the, 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 the checkpoint. Um, we believe that passengers who may be willing to submit commercial uh, uh, data and subject themselves to a different level of, level of vetting, maybe not as far as the pre-check level of vetting, but something that's easier and faster, can get a different experience, perhaps using dogs, the managed inclusion, et cetera. That's one way to achieve some efficiencies. TSA and CBP need to start working together on biometrics. Right now, they're both going in different directions. We need, again, to harmonize and focus on technology that's going to enable a more smooth process at the airport, but also increase our security. We need to accelerate the CT technology. Again, I want to say thank you. The language in the omnibus was very helpful, but that we need to move that deployment on quicker. We need more machines out there more quickly. I know you've been to Amsterdam. I have as well. I think it's good for screeners. It's good for the detection of the types of emerging threats that we're seeing. Can't say enough about dogs. It's one of our highest priorities. We're not where we need to be. You know, Darby mentioned they're at 242 right now. They should be at 372. We're pushing that TSA accelerate their third-party canine certification program, both in the cargo where they're making more progress, but also in the passenger environment. And finally, uh, couldn't agree more with Lorraine, we're diverting $1.3 billion every year away from security and making it go to deficit reduction. That needs to change. That money could come back in, be spent on CT and dogs, and I look forward to having the conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent points you made. As always, I appreciate your testimony. Um, our third witness is Ms. Wendy Ryder, uh, who is testifying on behalf of the American Association of Airport Executives. Ms. Ryder currently serves as Director of Av Aviation Security for Seattle Tacoma International Airport. We often get excellent input from them, and I'm looking forward to he hearing from you again. In this position, she leads support of Seattle's uh, Aviation Security Department and oversees all TSA mandates that involve the security of the 16,000 employees and travelers at the SeaTac Airport. Uh, prior to joining the Port of Seattle, Ms. Ryder was a station manager for Southwest Airlines and director of customer service for Northwest Airlines, where she received numerous awards for leadership and outstanding customer service. Ms. Ryder is now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Chairman Katko and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss operations at TSA checkpoints, the pre-check program, and the airport wait times. My name is Wendy Ryder, and I currently serve as the Director of Aviation Security for Seattle Tacoma Airport, which is owned and operated by Port of Seattle. I also recently served as Vice Chair of the Transportation Security Services Committee of American Association of Airport Executives. The story of SeaTac is one of dramatic growth, from 31 million passengers in 2010 to almost 47 million last year. The growth is a reflection of the dynamic economy and the global re re relevance of the Puget Sound region and SeaTac's increasingly important role in the national airspace system. At SeaTac, we are working overtime to try and accommodate the increasing demand. On our side, that requires major investment in infrastructure, technology, and staffing we are currently in the midst of a $3 billion capital investment program and have spent more than $20 million in staffing and technology to reduce the burden on TSA and increase the efficiency at their checkpoints. Similarly, TSA is being required to quickly increase their capacity to handle our growth. We deeply appreciate the partnership that we have with them, including both local TSA staff and TSA leadership in Washington, D.C. I also want to thank the subcommittee for your work on the Checkpoint Optimization and Efficiency Act, which has resulted in improved collaboration, communication, and information sharing at the local level. 
However, there's more work that needs to be done. At SeaTac, we have set a wait time goal of 20 minutes or less at the passenger screening checkpoints. We see this effort not only as a customer service priority, but a critical security measure. We know the best way to protect a soft target, such as an aggregation of people in the public area, is to process them to the sterile side of the airport as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, meeting that goal has been difficult, in large part because TSA hiring cannot keep pace with the attrition of TSA officers to the, hiring paying pro to the higher paying jobs that our region's economy is creating. To give you a sense of our challenges, we have 32 lanes currently available for security screening, yet TSA has not been able to staff more than 26 lanes recently at peak. We are approaching wait times of almost one hour. To compensate, we rely greatly on TSA's use of passenger screening canines for what they refer to as canine enhanced screening. While we consistently encounter issues with canine availability, we believe that these dogs are the best possible investment that the TSA can make. Their accuracy is even better than screening machines, and they assess current threats rather than pre-checks vetting of background risks. They provide the greatest efficiency gains. Therefore, we have significant concerns about reducing the ability to offer modified screening for general lane passengers that are screened by canines. We strongly support efforts to max maximize TSA pre-check enrollment. However, we know that one of the biggest threats to airports and passenger security is long wait times that create soft targets. Reducing the three throughput benefits of canines will increase that threat by more than doubling wait times at SeaTac's general screening lanes. Just this morning, the call out of one canine resulted in incident command because wait times that push general screening lanes onto our escalators. TSA should also take consideration the impact of wait times of the deployment of CT machines in the next few years. We support the added security that advanced technology will provide, but significant work will need to be done to address its implementation impacts such as throughput rates, false alarm resolutions, and physical checkpoint configurations. While passenger screening is by law the sole responsibility of TSA, airports play a political a critical role as partners. To that end, we hope that any changes that would impact security would be done in collaboration with us rather than being imposed. Thank you for your time today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, much Ms. Ryder. I'm kind of taken aback by the fact that you have one-hour wait times. That's something that, uh, that is not good from a security standpoint. It's an unsecure area of the airport, and uh, that's exactly what we don't want to hear. So we're going to have to address that um, in a meaningful manner. Um, we will follow up on that with our questions for sure. Say so the next witness here is um, Mr. Michael McCormick, the Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer for the Global, Global Business Travel Association. In his current role, Mr. McCormick leads GBTA's growth and globalization initiatives. Previously, he served as managing partner of Hudson Crossing, LLC the travel industry advisory business. McCormick has also served as president of biztravel.com and vice president of global supplier relations for Rosenbluth International. Mr. McCormick is now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Katko, uh, Ranking Member Watson Coleman, um, and members of the subcommittee. We appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Um, I'm Michael McCormick. I'm Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of the Global Business Travel Association, a role I've been in since 2009. GBTA is the world's premier business travel and meetings trade association headquartered here in Alexandria with operations on six continents. We have over 9,500 members and manage over $345 billion worth of global business travel and meeting expenditures annually. GBTA has 38 chapters and affiliates across this country and operations around the world. I want to thank Chairman Katko for the time he recently spent in our New York State chapter. They're still uh, bragging to all the other chapters about your January visit. GBTA's annual convention in the U.S. is the must-attend event a year for business travel. We'll have 7,000 attendees in San Diego this year with uh, uh, people from all over the U.S. as well as 50 countries. 
Uh, last year's event had an economic impact of $22.5 million just on the city of Boston alone in those four days. Um, the, the event and the economic impact is just a small sample of the uh, total impact of business travel in practice. And although we're a global organization, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary as a U.S. Trade Association here uh, in Virginia. So in July of 2017, we released a report that really showed uh, the industries responsible for $547 billion, about 3% of U.S. GDP, which is about the size of the domestic auto market. We support 7.4 million jobs and $135 billion in federal, state, and local taxes. You know, we always say that business travel drives business growth. Companies invest in business travel to drive new business, create new jobs, and build shareholder value. But as this busy summer season ramps up, we're concerned, as all of you are, about the past travel problems and screening, as well as past statements and policies on foreign visitation, and the impact that has not only in 2018, but beyond. Secure and efficient travel is a key platform in our legislative policy. We've been a supporter of pre-check since the first iteration of registered travel, uh, traveler, and because business travelers take over 500 million domestic business trips a year in this country alone. But our surveys cite that moving through airport security is one of the largest pain points still to this day. Um, PreCheck clearly offers travelers a risk-based intelligence, uh, you know, intelligence-driven aviation security that is safe, fast, and efficient. Time is money for business travelers, and inefficient procedures reduce business travel and the hassle factor that hurts the economy. We found that TSA PreCheck not only improves the airport screening process, but the, tra the entire travel experience by a significant amount. However, the current practice of allowing non-TSA PreCheck members into the security lines continues to be voiced frequently as a concern by travelers enrolled in the program. It's our belief that this continued practice undermines the impetus to enroll and calls into question the entire premise of the program, which is pre-screening travelers through, uh, who, through background checks have been identified as safe before they arrive at the airport. We need to put an end to this practice. GBTA fully supports the work done by the committee to limit uh, those not only cleared for pre-check to be allowed in those lanes. And GBTA is prepared to support new legislation to prohibit the practice. As we saw in summer of 2016, TSA pre-check cannot be the sole answer to long security lines. In GBTA's opinion, accurate travel forecasts, well thought out policies, and solid analysis of historical data, like our own business travel index, are key to TSA's ability to adequately staff checkpoints. Our most frequent findings show that U.S. origin business for travel is expected to accelerate significantly in 2018, advancing 6.1 percent, followed by roughly 7 percent growth in 2019 and 2020. Business travel gains have not reached this level since 2011. But also in these findings is an unusually high impact of many global uncertainties. The Global Economic Policy Uncertainty Index, which began in 97, has hit an all-time 20-year high. We're at a time of conflicting and sometimes seemingly contradictory views on how the business travel marketplace is trending and what the future holds. On one hand, as lower corporate taxes are pushed forward and business regulations are rolled back, some would argue that business travel is healthy. But other underlying factors have decidedly more negative impact on the future of business travel, including trade policy renegotiation, terrorism, travel and immigration bans, sanctions, electronic bans, and geopolitical tensions. GS GPTA is concerned that this uncertainty, along with ongoing rhetoric and policies, will send the message that the U.S. is closed for inbound global business. This dampening of demand for the U.S. as a business travel destination could cause a lasting negative economic impact that is masked in the near term by offsetting economic policies. This began with the current administration's first travel ban, which cost $185 million in business travel bookings in just one week. Then with a second, then a third ban filed, which is awaiting ruling from the Supreme Court, driving further uncertainty. There is no question that uncertainty is bad for business travel and bad for our role in the global economy. When we looked at our uncertainty forecast last year, 
the impact that it was having was significant. We projected a loss of $1.3 billion in overall travel-related expenditures in the U.S., which includes hotels, food, car rental, shopping, all the ancillary expenses. That included $250 million lost in spending from inbound travelers from Europe and the Middle East alone. Finally, our new forecast coming out will be out in August, looking at not only last year's total numbers, but the impact going forward. So looking forward, um, again, we're really concerned about all of this as it affects meetings and business travel. When you're looking at those, that planning that business, it's planned one to two years out, and we will only begin to see the impact of these decisions this year. So again, it goes without saying that GBTA strongly supports all of our efforts to keep the skies, borders, and countries safe. We continue to be a proponent for expanding proven security programs. I think a lot of the discussion that we talked about here today is so far and the questions coming forward. I mean, we have opportunities. I think there's been buy-in from TSA at the top, but not always the action we're looking for. So again, we have to find ways to look at the cumulative effect of all these policies and again, create the change the rhetoric and the perception that the U.S. is closed for business. Um, GBTA stands ready to improve the travel process and to make sure that this becomes a reality. And again, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. Appreciate your testimony. And I appreciate the testimony of all four of you. And I'm really glad that, that TSA is here to, to hear it all. I want to get into specifics, but could you just briefly answer to me? Um, could you just, each of you, just quickly tell me what? And, uh, the concerns you raise are very valid concerns and, and some very good ideas like merge and trust and travel and TSA and those types of things. Um, we don't have time to get into all of them, but I, how much interaction or how much, um, how should I say, meaningful interaction have you had with TSA in sharing your ideas with them? If you could just tell me briefly, each of you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sure. We have shared our recommendations with TSA. Last November, we published a report called Transforming Security at the Airports. Uh, we actually uh, have given this report to the administrator and many of the people that are over at TSA. <clears throat> excuse me. In addition, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the uh, ASAC checkpoint of the future report that came to Congress embodies the same recommendations that I opposed here today. Okay, thank you, Ms. Pinkerton. We work with TSA almost on a daily basis, and we can't um, say enough praise for Administrator Prokoski. Darby and others on his team um, that have done an outstanding job post the summer of 2016 setting up that kind of regular communication and coordination. Now, I will say some of the issues that we've talked about, some of these ideas, we have been talking to them about them for, for years. So um, the coordination, though, is, is very good. Okay, Ms. Ryder. I would say the same thing as Sharon. The associations and airports uh, communicate often if not daily with the with the TSA and it has been some of them for a long time in discussion particularly pre-check so same okay. Mr. McCormick yeah I'd say the same I mean the interaction is terrific and again we get buy-in from you know the top down but the reality is is that some of these areas we have to accelerate uh, particularly the marketing of the programs to the corporations it's, you know, it was mentioned in, in your uh, testimony, but there's a huge oppor uh, opportunity with the corporation as a community. These are people who are already vetted, already, the corporation knows more about the travelers than TSA even needs to, to, to have them qualify for, for pre-check. But, but, the, but the agency is maybe not the best at driving those programs, which is why we need the third party enrollment, why we need to really aggressively go after uh, the, the opportunities that are there in front of us. Okay. Well, I, I commend TSA for making yourselves available and, and doing the things you're doing to interact with the, with the, uh, um, the, the stakeholders. It's not an easy job you have, but I commend you for intera inter interacting with them. And it's clear that since my time in this chair that things have gotten a lot better at TSA, and a lot of it's because you're listening, and that's, that's a good thing. So I, I commend you for that. Um, also, you know, looking at 2016, that's a good example of that because there is a crisis in the, at the travel times. We learned that field service directors may not be interacting with the airlines as much as they should. They fix that, and they've, they've learned to open their gates a little bit sooner. They fix that. They've, they've learned to anticipate flows better, and they fix that. All those things are helping, and just keep going because I, I think they are making a difference. But I want to um, still, you know, uh, talk more a little bit more about pre-check. Um, it's really surprising to me why more airports do not have kiosks at the airport. It seems like such a basic, simple thing to do. 
And you saw what happened in, in, in my airport. When I, you, you heard my, test, my statements earlier about what's happened there with enrollments. It's, it's gone through the roof. Why can't airports do it, and what would be the impediment for them doing it? Any, any suggestions? Any, any, you're it, Ms. Ryder. Yes. Um, there, had, there are uh, quite a bit of restrictions that have put on the one company in what they need for infrastructure that is really difficult for the company to do, as well as some of the airports to get them the um, infrastructure that they need. So it's difficult for them to come into the airports. And when you say uh, restrictions, who's causing these restrictions? The airports, or is it the? It's um, actually, I think, what TSA requires of the of the company to to have to be able can to- Can you give some examples, airport. just so I understand Like how better. thick the walls need to be and, and what kind of infrastructure they need and what kind of IT requirements they need and it's extremely difficult for them to get in. Okay, but do you have it at your airport? Uh, I do. And how, how, do you, how is it working? Um, it's working great, it's working fine, yeah. Yeah, and, and we have increased pre-check because of that. Yeah, but perhaps we should have a good discussion with TSA, with, with the chairman, uh, with uh, the administrator, on how we can help maybe tweak that process and expedite, because we really um, we, we need to get them at airports. I haven't heard anyone at an, that has them at airports say it's not good. So uh, what's, how, how do we expand it to other airports? How do we incentivize other airports to get there? We'll st maybe we can straighten out some of these things, but what are some of the, is there reluctance at other airports to give up space, or what is it? I don't think there's a reluctance, um, but I, I would just make a pitch again for mobile enrollment. I mean, this we are everybody's using their mobile, and it wouldn't require a heavy infrastructure investment. And again, I I hear TSA talking about it. We we just we need to get it done. Okay. Anything there, else, Ms. Howerton? Sir, no, I concur with both of those comments. Okay. Sir, there's other airports that have offered to um, actually put it in their credential centers. The smaller airports that have the staff and are willing to do that, kind of as a third party that's been out there for years. So there's other opportunities. Yeah, because it seems to me the key to, to uh, anticipating, like Mr. McCormick said, the, the increase in travel. I mean, the projections are 30% more tra air travel in the next decade or two. We've got to be ready for it, right? And if we don't have pre-check uh, and we don't have ways to expedite the screening processes, we're going to be in trouble. And I think the canines is a good, maybe an intermediate way to do it. Um, but uh, And that's definitely a way to do it, I think. But it's not a foolproof way. Uh, it's not the best way if you don't know the traveler. I mean, if you know the traveler, pre-check's the best way, and I think, and we've got to really push that. So we should spend more time, and I would like to, if there's any other ideas you have about pre-check, um, I definitely want to hear from you because, uh, uh, to me, it's one of the keys. And if we can get to that 25 million, I think we're going to have a dramatically different landscape at airports. It really troubles me why you have one-hour waits. I know you're a popular airport, you're one of the most popular in the country, but, um, and that's to your credit, but... Is there something we're missing as to why those wait times are being caused? I think there's been a change in how the use of dogs is, is how long they can be used mm -hmm. that, that probably should be discussed as well down the line. Um, I think there's also some discussion about um, the attrition rate at our airports. We are one of the um, airports that the attrition rate is extremely high. And thank goodness the Air, uh, TSA is working with us on that. That, that. We have great collaboration with them. So thank you to Mr. LaJoy. He, um, they are working from top down on that. So um, we're struggling with that as well. So, um, and just, we are really a peak airport, but we're, we're really struggling between canines and, um, and attrition, it's, it's tough. All right, well, thank you very much. I just keep your input coming. I mean, obviously, one of the reasons we had this hearing today is because I heard from you uh, about the concerns about the wait times, and we gotta, I think we really need to put our heads together, TSA and all of us uh, in the industry, to figure out how the best way to market this. And you just gave some good ideas, and we're gonna go back and talk about them, and uh, I'm always willing to legislate, so uh, we'll see what we can do here. Uh, with that, I recognize Ms. Watson Coleman for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm certain you heard a little bit of my, test, my, my opening statement as it relates to what's happening with international travel, and I'd like to pursue that, uh, particularly with Mr. McCormick and Ms. Howerton. The data shows that the sharpest declines in inbound international visits came, direct, came directly following President's uh, first two travel bans. There's also been a sharp decline in tourists coming from Mexico, which Many have speculated as a direct consequence of the president's uh, plan to build a wall along the southern border, 
I have a series of questions uh, in support of this premise, and I first question is, what message do you believe that the President's policies and rhetoric are sending to the international visitors, Ms. Howerton and Mr. McCormick, if any? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, so last year when the, uh, the second uh, executive order uh, was put out in March, we pulled our European membership, and 38 percent of business travel professionals said their companies would be less willing to send business travelers to the U.S., and 45% uh, said they'd be less willing to plan future meetings and events in the U.S. Um, you know, Could you again, translate that into to, to money? Can yeah, you? the impact there, I mean, we were estimating last year the impact could have over like a $1.3 billion impact on, the, on, on uh, travel expenditures and related expenditures here in the U.S. And the problem is, is that when you're talking about particularly group and meeting travel, it's planned, again, one to two years out. So we're not even going to begin to see the impact of those changes until now and into next year. And so, again, that rhetoric is, is difficult, right, because just factually it, it has an impact on perception about doing business. And in a global economy, you know, again, companies mm -hmm. have options. They mm -hmm. don't have to come here for that type of travel. They can go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so that does create a problem mm -hmm. for us as an industry. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Howard, do you have anything to add to the Trump slump? Question. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you very much. Um, uh, actually, the U.S. market share in international travel has been sliding since 2015, so it's not new to this administration. That being said, uh, uh, the fact that there is not a welcoming message and what we're hearing uh, through all of the other issues for international uh, visitation is hurtful uh, to continuing uh, uh, an incline um, in uh, international travel. Um, we do need the president's help. It's, it's pretty clear. Um, robust tra travel is both compatible with his priorities for strong security, and it's critical to the priority to, to grow uh, um, jobs. Um, so we're hopeful that mm -hmm. uh, we will see an increase uh, once we get uh, some more movement underfoot for positive messaging. Mm -hmm. So do you think we're going to... Well, okay. So you believe that this is related to some positive messaging. Has we, your industry been able to do anything to sort of express this concern uh, to the parties or party uh, principally responsible for the depression of um, international travel because of the rhetoric? Have you all like sought meetings with those entities or individuals who would um, who are her responsible for this? Yeah, we, we actually are a member of a uh, uh, U.S. Travel Coalition, Visit U.S. Travel uh, Coalition, and it's a coalition of many members, both members that are within the U.S. travel footprint of membership and organizations that are outside of it. The primary purpose of this organization is to work with the administration on ways we can increase international travel, ways mm -hmm. we can message it, ways we can impact uh, international visitors coming here and the jobs that international travel creates. So have you specifically been able to communicate to anybody in the administration representing the interests of this president or even the president himself uh, the concerns that, that have been raised by the, 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 the rhetoric, the negative rhetoric and how it's impacted possibly people coming from Mexico and people coming from other uh, places around the world? Have, have you, to your knowledge, Ms. Howerton, or you, to your knowledge, Mr. McCormick? We have had meetings with, the, uh, with administration officials. Yes, we have. And have they recognized the possibility of this being a problem and seeking to a course correction here, as if anybody has any control over the president's mouth? They had we... listened intently. Thank you. Mr. McCormick, do you have anything to share with them on that? No, I, I think on that front, I mean, again, we've also met with the administration and every and, and anyone that will meet and listen because of the importance of this issue. I mean, it is, uh, you know, it's critical. This uh, business travel drives the economy. And, yeah. uh, and, I, and I think there's, a, there's an understanding that, of that, but I think, again, we have a lot more work to do to have that fully embraced right. in a way that affects uh, the, way, the way work is done. Well, I have several time. more questions. I'm going to close with this question. Okay. Um, like I know this is this is going to, this is impacting jobs, impacting spending, impacting our economy negatively. What is it that you think Congress can do? 
to help to counteract the Trump slump's impact on uh, incoming international travel? I'd be interested in knowing. And with the answer to that question, Ms. Howerton, Mr. McCormick, and anybody else that's at the witness table would like to uh, respond to that, I would yield back after that. Well, I would just say that I think you're doing it. I mean, this is a perfect example of uh, very good bipartisan efforts to address the issues that are affecting travel and to give us the forum to deliver the message. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, we could do more together, I think, to have those meetings and to impress upon everybody about this importance. Again, we're all on the same side on this issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is something that I don't think there's yeah. anything we're saying here that you would have an argument against. It, the tactics are the issue, right? And the enforcement is the issue. But so, you know, last, last comment? That's fine. Um, while we're focusing now on international travel coming to us, there's also a question about whether or not we as Americans, businesses, whatever, um, are reluctant to go to do international travel because for fear that we're not liked anymore uh, as a result of this kind of rhetoric. And so that affects the industry in terms of hotels and, and, and things of that nature. And, and I think that that's something, this whole area is something that we need to explore a little bit uh, close, more closely in the upcoming future and with that. Well, again, I, I mean, we'd welcome the dialogue because companies have a, a bigger obligation in terms of duty of care and risk management. We're sending travelers now all over the world to destinations yeah. to do business and to grow business. I mean, companies, every company is global these days. Every company has business and is looking for new business anywhere in the world. Yeah. So, I mean, the, we do have an obligation. We have an obligation as a country, right, to address the issues and to give the companies that are driving our economy the support they need. As our ally base seems to be shrinking, we need to be very careful preserving and protecting our opportunities internationally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Watson-Coleman. And I thank all of you for your testimony here today. Um, it's been very helpful and very thought-provoking, and my poor staff is going to get tortured with a lot of assignments now for, because of that. But I do, I do understand, and I appreciate the problem, and I appreciate the much better interaction with the industry than there has been. And I commend all of you at TSA for that. And I commend all of you for keeping with it because it's really important. And uh, the more we hear from you, the more we know what to do. So uh, I thank you for that very much. And um, before we wrap up, I just want to let you know that we have uh, the pre-check bill coming. And that will be coming in the next week or so? Mm -hmm. You sure? OK, week <laughs> or so. Yes. Um, those are my bosses back here, but uh, they, uh, we're going to be getting that out, and uh, it's not to torture TSAs, but just to make sure we make it clear that pre-check means pre-check. But there's also things we can do to help expedite the program, and I think, we can, I think the, uh, the merger of, of the two uh, systems is a good idea, and some of the other things that we can do. So we thank you for that as well, and um, with that, I want to uh, thank all the members for your testimony. Members of the committee may have some additional questions for the record. And witnesses, uh, and we will uh, ask you to respond to those in writing. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7D, the hearing record will remain open for 10 days. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned.